day is Father's Day. Uh, we've said happy Father's Day to our fathers, and uh, we'll have a little bit more to say about that at the end of our service as well. And as I said when we came to Mother's Day about a month and a half ago, when one considers the various holidays of a Western culture, uh, most do not necessarily deserve any sort of mention within the church uh, from a purely biblical standpoint. We, of course, have the, the, the Western holidays that are, are very Christian in nature. Uh, many intersect with the church. We talk about Christmas and resurrection and uh, Thanksgiving being the big ones. Uh, but then there are these other two that are truly of note that do reflect, and very much so in their character, uh, biblical principles, and that is Mother's Day and Father's Day. And in all honesty, uh, Father's Day is a little bit easier uh, to preach to, for me than Mother's Day. Maybe a part of that is that I am a father. Uh, but certainly while we have very good examples in the Bible of, of women, um, and, and most of those women, if not all of them, were in fact mothers, um, good principles pertaining to mothers, uh, it's even argued in Orthodox Judaism and, and often in Christianity also that uh, as we see the picture of God in the Bible, he is in fact a balanced representation of the characteristics he has built into both men and women um, so that we see God as the penultimate and, and thus the marriage union kind of uh, creates more together than it does apart as, as the women and the men come together to fill in those gaps of the divine character in each of themselves. And, and all of that, I believe, is, is, is true. Uh, that is one of the reasons why marriage is such a powerful institution, because it brings together the attributes of God that he has in, imbued into both men and those that he has imbued into women into a one flesh union, which again, together becomes more than the sum of its parts. Uh, however, for all that we, we might believe God to be that way, and, and for all that we, we recognize that, that God has made um, both male and female, and he has uh, created the institution of the family and, 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 and added both mother and father to that. The reason why father, Father's Day is a little bit easier to preach in this sense is because when God chose the means by which to define himself to mankind, he chose to call himself Father. And so whereas we have good examples throughout history of mothers, we have a perfect example of a father. God is God. He is not beholden to mankind's definition of him. He is self-existent. He is self-defined. And the reason why this is so interesting is because God, who is self-existent and self-defined, chose the label of father to describe the relationship which he has between himself and those of the human race who would choose to receive him. And God did not place in the Bible artificial lines of distinction between the concept of fatherhood as it relates to humans and their offspring and the concept of fatherhood as it relates to God and his spiritual creation. He uses the word father. It's not a different word for father. He uh, reflects fatherhood in, in the nature of, of how he speaks of himself. He reflects fatherhood in the nature of how Jesus speaks to him. Uh, Jesus compares our heavenly father uh, to earthly fathers and uh, uses that that same word and that same context by which to help us understand our Heavenly Father. And we must believe that this was, in fact, deliberate. We must believe that it was a deliberate choice that God made when He caused the Holy Scriptures to be inspired to break down the barriers of distinction between the nature of His relationship to those in humanity who would come to Him and receive Him by faith in His Son, and the nature of the relationship between human men and their offspring. And this in and of itself is informative and is helpful because it means that if I want to be a good father, if I want to know what it is to be a good father, to understand what a good father looks like, if I want to discern whether or not I am being the kind of father that perhaps I ought to be, I don't have to look to any man. I do not have to look to my bi biological father. I do not have to look to another man's biological father. I can instead look at my holy father, my heavenly father. And I can 
measure myself against the characteristics of my father in heaven and know what it is to be a good father and know exactly how I'm doing as a father. And of course, no father in this room is measured up or ever will to our heavenly father. But we've got that, that rule. We have that standard. To that end, fathers, today what I'd like to do is simply walk through a couple passages of Scripture. And these passages of Scripture are going to be about God as our Heavenly Father. And as we do so, we will be reminded about what fatherhood looks like. And as we hold ourselves up against the perfection of God's character, we'll be exhorted and admonished to be good fathers. We will, every single one of us, as I read these passages today, will fall short of what I'm about to read. And we will look at that, and we will understand that, and we will acknowledge that, and then we will, in our lives, with the help of the Holy Spirit, understand how we can better reflect our Heavenly Father in the way that we father our children. Now, I could walk through the statistics as it relates to why it is that fathers are so important. I'm not going to go into that this year. I've gone into that in years past. Why is it that, that, that fathers are so important to society, to the home, to our children? I could go through the statistics on fatherless homes and show you how an absentee father, whether that's absentee in actual physical presence in the home or even absentee in his duties and his responsibilities as he's present in the home, but he absolutely takes a back seat. Uh, he... He does not um, lead, he does not invest, he does not engage, he does not do what he ought to do as a father. We could go through the statistics and talk about how many uh, children have been led to ruin and, and, and the, the despairing statistics between those that have a father in the home and those that do not. We could walk through the testimony of men and women who struggled to relate themselves to the God of the Bible specifically because their father or their father figure uh, was, was a terrible figure, and so they, they bore in their heart resentment toward their father. And then when they read in the Bible that God is our heavenly father, they immediately bear resentment toward him, or they cannot relate to him, or they cannot invest in him properly because they say, I do not want a father. I, I, I did not like my father. Uh, I, I, I don't want anything to do with a father. And we can talk about all of these things, and, and all of those things are very true. And it is an important message, but today I, I, I don't really want to go in that direction. Today I simply want to talk about who God is as a father. And I hope that every single one of us who is a father or a father-to-be will walk away determined to follow his example. And so we're just going to look at three characteristics of our father today, our heavenly father, and understand through them what we can do what we ought to do, who we ought to be as earthly fathers. And point number one about our father. He is abounding in deliberate love. I'm not going to get complicated with the message today, but there are things here which every father needs to consider very carefully in his life. Deliberate love. We've defined love many times at Legacy Baptist Church. We're going to talk about it again next week as we get into the fruit of the Spirit. At Legacy Baptist Church, we define love biblically as a conscious choice to do what is best for another, regardless of self-interest or regardless of circumstance. That love is when I make a conscious and a deliberate choice. It's not something I fall into. It's not something I fall out of. It's not something that I accidentally do. It's not emotion-based. It is will-based. It is choice-based. A choice, a conscious choice, a deliberate choice to do what is best for another regardless of my own self-interest and regardless of the circumstances within which I find myself. That is love. Now, again, we don't always measure up to that love, but this is definitionally the way the Bible defines love. This is what Jesus did for us on the cross. This is what God did when he sent his son to die on the cross. And I would like you to think through the nature of God's love toward you today uh, as, as the basis for thinking through this idea of love. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, uh, Romans, uh, by chapter 5, uh, Paul is speaking of the nature of the gospel, those who are lost, and then the grace of God that is found through Jesus Christ. And Paul says in verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, 
Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were sinners, oh, excuse me, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Consider what we just read together. You and I are sinners without strength, unable in any way to do anything in ourselves to please God, to reconcile ourselves to God, to be right with God. Under the wrath of God, by virtue of the sin that we have committed, by virtue of the sin which we have inside of us, all of our righteousnesses as filthy rags before a holy God, a sinner who has in every way fallen short of God's glory and absolutely unworthy of the very least of God's favors. And you know that that is you, right? You are the ungodly of Romans 5 verse 6. That every time you offend the character of God, every time you sin, you exercise your will in defiance to the God who created you. You are uh, the enemy enemies of Romans 5 verse 10. And yet when we were without strength, when we were enemies, when we were in that place of ungodliness, the Bible says in due time, when God was ready, when history was ready, Christ came and he died for the ungodly. He died to pay for your sin so that you could then be made righteous by his blood. He was made sin for us, First, uh, 2 Corinthians tells us 5 that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But it really is verse 10 that I would like us to consider with more clarity. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we were enemies, the text tells us, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. You are the least lovable of God's creation, not you, but we, you, in that you are we, willfully exercising yourself in contradiction to God. And God's response was to love you with such depth that he sent his only son to pay for the sins that you could not pay to earn the righteousness you could not earn and then to give that righteousness to you when you accept the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ, through belief in Jesus Christ alone. In order that you might be reconciled to God, brought close, and through bringing you close, you might become the adopted son of God. And then much more being reconciled, you are then saved by his life. You then live in the life that is God. And then as you live in that life, you receive all of those blessings of sonship. That is all that God did for you because he loved you. So that 1 John chapter 1, verse 12 tells us, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as received him, in the context that being the word of God made flesh, who is Jesus Christ the righteous, as many as received Christ and his sacrifice through belief on his name, to all those were given the power, the right, the authority to be called the sons of God. God becomes our father. And let's think through what that means. That means that God loves you deliberately. He even loves those who have not received that gift, though they are not yet his sons in that theological sense. They are his creation. They are not his sons, but God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And then as we receive that gift of salvation by grace through Jesus Christ, we are ushered into sonship. We are made to become the sons of God. And the desire that God would be reconciled to his creation, the desire of God that adopted us into his family, thus then makes him our father, whereby he has already shown deliberate, intentional reconciliation and love toward us, abounding, in fact, in deliberate love. That God took the first steps in loving his children, sending his son to die on the cross so that as many as received him would be given the power to become the sons of God. 
And then he, they, we would be ushered into this unique personal relationship with God by which he is in fact our father. And he deals with us as children, already having shown us the absolute and ultimate of love, giving us confidence that in every step of the way with everything that he does with us in every way that he deals with us, whether that's good days or bad days, good health or bad health, uh, uh, prosperity or, or lack, in every step of the way, we already have the confidence that it is not because God does not love us. And we know that it's not because God does not love us because he's already shown the ultimate love in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And so our father is abounding in deliberate love. And fathers, fathers of Legacy Baptist Church, it is our privilege to be very deliberate with our children. It's our privilege to make sure that our children know just how much we love them. We'll talk about discipline in our final point. But as parents, because this does apply to mothers as well, but specifically as fathers, our children should never wonder, at least based on our actions, obviously there's going to be other reasons emotionally and such why our children might, might fall into this rut. But from the standpoint of the way that we act, interact, and dispose ourselves toward our children, they should never wonder whether we love them. We should never wield our love for our children as a weapon against them. Your acceptance of your child, your favor towards your child, your love for your child should never be interpreted by your children as being conditioned upon their behavior. You realize that God's love for you is not conditioned upon your behavior. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were the ungodly, Christ died for us. When we were enemies, Christ died for us. God's love for you is not conditioned upon your behavior. Fathers, your love for your children is not conditioned upon their behavior. When at once I believed in Christ and rest under the blood of Christ, when I entered into the relationship by which I accept the love that the Father has shown unto us and entered into sonship, I at that point have every confidence that I am accepted, that I am a child of God. There's no conditions, there's no strings, there's no variance. There's never a day where the love of God does not rest upon me, where my loving father rejects me, and I know that because he already sent his son to die for me. He has already paid the price for me. He has already done what's necessary to reconcile me, and I have accepted that, and I have been accepted, as we'll see in a moment in Ephesians 1, into the beloved. Now, there are days where he may not be pleased with what I'm doing. But on the day that, uh, that the Lord is not pleased with what I am doing, even on the day, again, as we'll talk about in our final point, where he must discipline me for my rebellion, for my selfishness, for whatever it might be, on that day, there is still no question if I look objectively at the scriptures and I look objectively at what God has done for me, on the day where I am under his hand of chastening, I can still not question whether or not he loves me. As a matter of fact, in that day of trial, in that day of temptation, in that day of chastening, in that day of hardship, that is the day where I, I will oftentimes know God's love the best if I have the right perspective. I know that I'm accepted because I'm a child of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So Paul then says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I was not made a child of God by mistake. God, God harbors no regrets related to my sonship to him. I am accepted according to the glory of his grace, not according to my efforts, not according to my merits. That was never a part of the equation. Before I, well before I was ever born, God sent his son to die for me. 
I am accepted according to the great love wherewith he has loved me. And fathers, if love is a choice and your children have been given to you by God, then it is your privilege to reflect the same love upon your children. God forbid your children should fail to know your love for them. God forbid your children should ever think that your love for them is conditioned upon their merits. By virtue of God having given your child to you, within the theological sense, the idea is that God has reached out to every man by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then those who accept him are then made sons of God and they receive the full privileges of sonship. We, we, we would say that in that same sense, when we are born again, we are brought into the full measure of the sonship. That, that, that God reached out to us in love through Jesus Christ before we were, we were in that sonship, and yet then when we entered into that sonship, we received the full merits. By, by, by you being born, child, fathers, by you having that child, that is an implicit determination of love. You are called then by the very character of God as your father to be that kind of father to your children to love them as your Father in heaven loves you. May our children never wonder whether or not we love them. May we never wield our love or our care or our treatment of our children as a weapon to manipulate them or compel them or otherwise demand something of them. Because that's not love. That kind of manipulation whereby we wield love as a weapon that's not, God, God has never and will never do that. That is not God. That is anti-God. That is anti-God's character. That is truly anti-Christ. It is anti the very essence of what Christ came to do. God did not send his son to wield his love as a weapon. Nor does he wield it as a weapon among his children. That operates in direct contradiction to the example set forth of our Heavenly Father who comes to us from a position of love. And when it's time to chasten, he comes from a position of love. And when it's time to, to test or to strengthen, he comes from a position of love. And when it's time to bless, it comes from a position of love. It is always from a position of love, always. Now, I've tried to be careful in my expression here because in our current culture and environment, what I've just said can be quite easily twisted and perverted to mean something that I did not say. To accept our children... For them to know our love for them, for our love for them to never be conditioned upon their actions and their choices, that idea that we're doing everything that we're doing from a position of love in no way implies that I must agree with or affirm or otherwise support their actions or choices. That is not a part of the equation. We'll talk more about this when we get to the idea of loving correction, which is our final point. Much to the contrary, to agree with, affirm, or otherwise support my child when my child is engaged in evil, lies, evil choices, or to go along with our children's attempts to manipulate our love to further their own emotional or physical or spiritual destruction is not love at all, right? It is not love at all for a child to expect that a parent is going to affirm them in their own destruction. I cannot love my child by affirming their destruction, by affirming their harm, by affirming a, a, a course of action that will lead to further sorrow in their life. That, that, that's not love. So I'm not saying today that a position of love means that that will be a position of always agreeing with or affirming our child in their actions. But what our child ought to be able to do, fathers, is say, and... They might be angry, they might, they, they might be resentful, they might be all of those things because mom and dad or dad does not agree with what I'm doing and will not support me in it. But in their heart, in, their, in, in the core of their being, they, they will have to admit, my parent still loves me. There's absolute love here. They have not rejected me. They have not cast me out. I am still beloved, even if I'm in rebellion, and they cannot support my decisions. 
And fathers, it is our privilege to walk that line. And to that end, fathers, love will often ask of you a measure of pain. Which is how you know that love is a choice and not a feeling. Because if love were a feeling, then the minute that it hits pain, there's no more love, right? Love dissolves the minute that there's pain if it's just a feeling. But if love is a choice, because I choose to love, here's the thing. Those I choose to love will often fail to love me back. Those I choose to love will often make choices that will betray my love or hurt me or drive me to much sorrow. And we should expect this too. Maybe not of your children. Lord willing, our children will never drive the fathers in this room to such sorrow. But we know it's true because indeed God's love toward me has no doubt driven him to much sorrow, right? Right? that my actions have no doubt grieved my Heavenly Father time and again. I certainly cannot say that because God loves me unconditionally, that means he, ha he has or will affirm every choice that I make. And instead, He will take the part of the grieved Father at times when I have wandered from Him, when I have gone astray, when I have chosen to rebel, when I have uh, stuck my foot down and spat in His face and shaked my fist and said, I'm not doing it your way. And he will grieve just as he disciplines and chastens and blesses from a position of love. He will grieve from a position of love and long for the day when his child comes back to him. So God's love toward me has no doubt driven him to much sorrow, but it also compels him to respond at times, never, however, outside of love, only through love. Never against my best interest, even if I myself don't understand my best interest. And fathers, it's our privilege to do the same. Always from a position of love. Never does God use his love for me as a manipulative tool against me to compel or force my behavior or anything of the sort. And again, I hope that will become clear in his final point. So first, our Heavenly Father is abounding in deliberate love. And fathers, may we as well toward our children abound in deliberate love. Second, our Father abounding in generous intentions. So God loves us. And those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior by grace through faith know the fullness of this love and have entered into that position of that relationship of love by grace through faith. And if you are a child of God, you know this love. Our Father has given us no reason to doubt His love. It is written in the very fabric of Christ's sacrifice and the indwelling Holy Spirit, which each of you has if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Fathers, your child should know this love. Your child should have confidence in, 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 in your love for them as well, that your love does not diminish toward them, that you don't regret them in any way, that even if you aren't always pleased with their actions, you are always pleased with them in the sense of you do not regret them, no matter how regrettable their actions might be. Second, then, we find that our Father abounds in His generous intentions toward His children. He delights in His children's wellness. And we read about this idea in Matthew 7, and this is an interesting passage. Verses 7 through 11, Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If, then ye, if ye then, excuse me, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And the reason why I say this is a bit of an interesting passage to use in contemplating the relationship of fathers to their children is because it actually assumes upon the goodness of an earthly father to establish the character of the heavenly father. So here I am today trying to establish the character of an earthly father by putting him up against the heavenly father. And then I'm going to a passage that establishes the character of the heavenly father by putting him up against an earthly father to teach us how to be better earthly fathers through our heavenly father is being compared to an earthly father. So that's a little bit different. 
But Jesus takes something for granted in this little object lesson, which is very interesting. What he takes for granted is that a father, when his son asks for bread, wants to give him bread and will give him bread if it is in his power to do so. That a father, when his son asks his father for a fish, wants to give him that fish and will give him that fish if it is at all within his power to do so. In other words, it takes for granted the idea that a father desires to bless his children. And Jesus says, if this is true of heavenly fathers, how much more true, or excuse me, of earthly fathers, how much more true is it of the heavenly father? How much more will the heavenly father give good gifts to the children who ask of him? In other words, that intrinsic desire that our fathers in this room have felt toward their sons, whereby they desire to bless their children. Now, that's not always the case, right? Because we as fathers are fallible and we are emotional and there are times where our children, we don't want to bless them, we just want to toss them out a window. But as a general rule, our children, we love them, we desire their best, we desire to bless them. We receive such blessing from seeing our children well and happy and contented and excited. And we desire to give good gifts to our children. We desire to to give them the things that they desire to have. And maybe it's outside of our means. Maybe it's outside of our capabilities. Maybe there's reasons based upon how it is our children are acting that we actually are unable to reward them by giving them certain things. And yet in this case, it's simply talking about sustenance. The father who desires to give his child what his child needs. And there's something, there, there are some wonderful connected lessons about the nature of asking and receiving in prayer that this teaches us, the nature of how it is that we pray to God and what to expect from God. And, and, and those we're not going to cover today, we'll certainly come back to them at some point. We, we hit prayer from time to time. However, for today, we call our minds to God's desire to bless his children, to give them good gifts, to give them what they ask for. And may our fatherly hearts be this way as well. And fathers, I'm preaching this message because many of you can testify. Many of you have not had good fathers. Many of you grew up with resentment towards your fathers. Maybe you're still struggling with resentment towards your father. Many of you had bad father figures. As I'm preaching this message today, many of you cannot relate to this on the level of your actual earthly father. And that is a tragedy for several reasons. One, of course, is because that, that makes life hard on you as you have to carry with you the difficulties of, of your father's choices that you did not ask for. You did not choose that father. You did not ask for that father, but his choices have affected you and have, you've had to carry them with you through your life. And so that there is that idea. And yet, remember, child, this is your heavenly father. Your heavenly father does desire to give good gifts to his children. And may our fatherly hearts be that way so that we in this room who are raising up the next generation do not create another generation of frustrated children who become frustrated adults because of their own fathers. May our children never be afraid to ask of us blessings. May we not be so close-handed so disinterested, so distracted, so disengaged from our children that they do not believe that they can come to us for the things that they need. And this is perhaps even more relevant to their emotional and spiritual needs than it is to their physical needs, Father. It's not just about whether or not you can provide for them uh, the, the, the things that they desire by way of, uh, of food on the table or clothes on their backs or the, uh, or, or, or amusements or entertainments or whatever it might be. Don't get fixated, Father, on the idea that being a good father simply means that when my kid wants something, I give it to him. That's not the idea here. We're talking about the heart of a father to meet his son's needs. And if a father says, I'm going to work 24-7 in order to have enough money to, do, to give my kids all of the things that they want, 
but he's not around for his children, he has missed the point. Yes, we want to have the kind of spirit whereby our children should feel free to express their desire for things, their needs, even their wants to the degree that they have confidence that those wants are healthy and good. I love the fact that my children are still uh, willing to come up and ask me somewhat boldly for things that would be outside of the norm. Can we go get ice cream? Can we do this? Can we do that? Um, they're regularly and pretty characteristically going to hear no when they ask that question, but I'm always glad that they ask. I want them to feel that they can come to dad and ask. I want to be open enough that they don't just say, well, dad's gonna, never gonna have, not, not gonna happen anyway, I'm just not gonna ask. Well, what if dad says yes? Because see, dad has a desire to say yes. I want them to, to feel that. But all the more so. What about their emotional and spiritual needs? God forbid that my children are so afraid of getting into trouble with dad so afraid of making dad angry, so afraid of losing dad's respect, or here it is, first point, dad's love, that my child will fail to tell me what's going on in his or her heart, will fail to seek unto me for wisdom, counsel, direction, aid in that day where they don't know what to do, when they're struggling. When my child is struggling emotionally or spiritually, it's essential that he or she understands my generous intentions toward them and thus feels free to seek unto me to help them navigate the difficulties of this life. And this is something that people can struggle with even with God. I can't tell you how many times I've been at the jail talking to someone who is in the throes of addiction. And I say, well, how did it go last time you were out? And he said, well, things were going pretty well and I was in AA or NA and, and, and then... Uh, then a really hard thing happened, you know, so, uh, loss in the family or financial hardship, and then I started using. And, and when I started using, I stopped going to church and I stopped reading my Bible and I stopped praying because, uh, you know, I, I, I know how much God was not happy with me for using again. And the feeling is I can only go to dad when I'm being an acceptable person. I can only go to dad. Dad rejects me when I am doing something objectionable. Heavenly Father, right? And so they back away from Heavenly Father as they get further into objectionable action. But isn't that the exact opposite of what we would want as a father for our children? If my child is struggling, isn't the thing that I want for them to come to me and say, Dad, can you help me? Dad, this is the day that I need you. Now, this is not natural to human nature. We want to hide from the people that love us and that we love our flaws and our foibles specifically because we don't want to mar the relationship. And yet what we find in our Heavenly Father is a Father whose hand is open and who loves us so that in the hard day, that's the day He wants us to come to Him. The hard day is the day to be in church. The hard day is the day to open your Bible. The hard day is the day to get on your knees and spend more time with God. That's what I do on the hard day. And I go to a God who loves me and, and, and who will openly say, I'm not pleased with what you are doing, but I, I sent my son to die for you. I died for that sin too. So come and let me help you. So come and tell me your burdens. And would that my children would see in me an openness of countenance and of character, whereby in their day of hardship, in their day of struggle, in their day of confusion, in their day of, 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 of emotional or spiritual a temptation that they, would, that they would see in their father an openness to receive the help that, that they need. Father, this is why we're there. All throughout the Psalms, what does David reflect upon? In the loving guidance of his God. His times of sorrow, his times of confusion, his times of anger, his days where he wants to avenge himself, his days where he doesn't know what's going on. And he says, I flee to the rock that's higher than I am. And I come and I rest under the shadow of my father's wings. And then he, he finds a place of security and stability by which then he is able to step up and into right actions. 
And David writes how he finds in his heavenly father that source of comfort and stability and care. And certainly we as fathers should not desire to usurp our child's relationship with God as father. We are not their God, right? We, you are not your child's God. That Your child should not run to you for emotional and spiritual stability in, in, in the long term. When it, once they are believers and so themselves children of God, it's a good thing that a child uh, transitions their love and trust uh, from the, the need for their earthly father in that, in that way to, to their heavenly father. And, and yet, at the same time, this is the character that we have as a father, that we ought to have as a father. We carry that character. It helps our children relate to their heavenly father better. And it also gives them an earthly source of comfort and security, of stability and of care in the hard days. And then they can operate with the confidence of knowing that your intentions toward them are only good. On the day that the child does not like the way you're disciplining them, on the day that your child does not like the choice that you made for them, they might be able to say, I disagree with dad on this. They might be able to say, I don't like what dad did and I'm angry at dad for that. But what they should not be able to say is that I, I, I doubt my father's intentions toward me. And it was a good thing, children, uh, Fathers, if your children come to you in that day, you would rather have them come to you in that day who loves them and who, whose intentions are right toward them than necessarily some random friend or somebody else's father or, or even their pastor. Now, I'm happy to help anyone who's having emotional, spiritual, physical issues, but if a child comes to me in place of their parents, that's, that's, not, that's not the right solution. Maybe it's the necessary solution. Maybe their parent is not what they ought to be and they need someone else and they need the pastor to be for them what their parent's not being. But that's not the ideal solution. And by the way, parents, as a matter of course on this, there is no scenario where I would ever allow your child to go over your head and come to me without exhorting them to be right with you. You're their parent. I'm not their parent. I don't need to keep secrets for children from their parents or anything of the sort. There was a big uh, push in, the, in a generation of, of, of particularly among youth group. If, if you can't talk to your parents, come talk to me. Um, that's, that's not the way I pastor. Uh, it's not my right. It's not my duty. It's not my privilege to become your child's confidant against you. Now, if a child comes to me with a problem and the solution involves the parents, obviously, if the parent is disinterested, then fine, we'll work together without them because the parents aren't interested. If there's something illegal or immoral happening, obviously, we deal with uh, the proper authorities as a matter of biblical obedience. But it is not my, my right, duty, or privilege to become your children's confidant against you. But the desire is that this would never necessarily be necessary anyway. Because if you... If your children know your love and your intentions toward them, then you can be that for them, as it ought to be. And you can help them navigate the emotional and spiritual burdens of life as it ought to be. And you can point them to their Heavenly Father as the ultimate source of guidance and comfort as it ought to be. And they will receive this from you specifically because they trust your intentions toward them. So our Father is abounding in deliberate love. And fathers, we ought to be abounding in deliberate love toward our children. Our father is abounding in generous intentions, and we ought to be abounding in generous intentions toward our children. Third and finally, our father is abounding in loving correction. And so ought we. We mentioned in our first point that the idea that our children are unambiguously accepted and loved by us does not mean that, they are, that all of their actions are unambiguously accepted or loved by us, because no parent in love could accept the things that my child does which serve to harm them, confuse them, or destroy them. And to this end, fathers, we have the privilege of following our Heavenly Father as a good and faithful corrector of our children. The natural end of this command comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. 
My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. This verse is, the elaborate, is then elaborated upon, excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, we read this. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? What kind of a son, what kind of a relationship is there? Does the father even actually recognize his son? Does he actually love his son? Is he even his son if he's not willing to chasten him? So verse 8 says, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. That being illegitimate children. You are not, if God is not chastening you, when you, are, when you go astray, then you had better very closely look at whether you are actually a child of God because this is what a loving father does to his sons. He chastens them. Verse nine, furthermore, we have, had fa- we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection under the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us, that would be fathers on earth after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. A loving father disciplines his children. A loving father corrects his children, so much so that in the Proverbs, the Bible says that the man who spares the rod hates his son. The man who does not discipline his son is pouring contempt upon his son. Why? Because correction is what brings our children into preservation, wellness, stability, life. A father that does not discipline and correct his children is not loving that child. Doesn't matter what the psychologists say. Doesn't matter what the sociologists say. Doesn't matter what the modern theories say. If you are not Disciplining your child, you are, you are not in an active and engaged love of that child. He's allowing that child to persist in thoughts and actions which are harmful to him. And that is not love. That is, in fact, rejection. And notice God's objective in discipline and in correction from the text. Chastening is not a pleasant process, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto those who are exercised thereby. Notice that the objective is not behavior modification. Did you notice that? God does not chasten us to modify our behaviors. God chastens us to align our hearts. It does not say that, that, that it yields the, 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 the fruit of obedience, of, 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 of alignment. It says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It brings about the fruit of a heart that is aligned. The purpose of discipline and chastening is to help our children learn to submit, to help them learn what is right, to equip them to be strong and capable and stable human beings. Father, if you are not correcting and disciplining your child, you are depriving him of the most necessary lessons you can possibly teach him. You are depriving him of wisdom, of understanding, and of character. And they may grow up to be able to read and to write and to do math, but they will not grow up into wisdom and character if they are not disciplined. And so they will not be capable of navigating life unto the Lord as they ought. Now, no one likes discipline. My children don't like receiving discipline or correction. I don't like giving discipline and correction. The process is not joyous, it is grievous. Whether that be the discipline of direct correction, such as spanking a child, removing privileges and the like, or whether that be the discipline that comes through the, uh, the process of growing them, right? Hard work, a day of hard work. Giving to our children responsibilities. It's a whole lot easier a lot of times for me just to do the thing myself than to try to coordinate my children to do it and to stay on top of them to get it done. It's a lot more work for me. It's a lot more work for them. No one likes it. I don't like it. Well, Dad, you're making us do all the work. You have to like it. No, I don't like it because I have to coordinate and teach you how to do it now. That's a whole lot more work than just doing it myself. 
I don't like that. But it's the right thing to do. It's the thing that builds character, responsibility. It's what turns my children into capable adults one day. This is how we grow, isn't it? This is how we grow. And truly, it's the only way that we're going to grow. To that end, the objective of discipline and correction is to orient our children unto life as it truly exists, to orient our children unto truth, to help our children understand how to align themselves with, orient themselves unto truth, to learn what it is to submit to authority, to learn what it is to align even when they don't agree, to learn what it is to have integrity and work ethic and character. It is not about whether or not they're so afraid of me that they're going to do the thing I ask them to do. It is about whether or not I can, I can mold their hearts into hearts that are supple, into hearts that are listening, into hearts that, are, are, that have integrity, into hearts that, 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 are, that have character. It's that lower layer. That's what discipline is about. That's what God does for us. And that's what we have the privilege of doing for our children. Discipline and correction are always subject to truth. And apart from truth, discipline and correction are meaningless. If discipline and correction, Father, in the context of your home is just you enforcing your will, imposing your will on your children, you are not disciplining properly. There is a process of drawing them into truth, into character that is discipline. And this is why a loving father who will always accept the person of his child will not always accept the actions of his child. I had this conversation with my son just the other day. I went up to him and I told him, you know, son, I need you to know this. While I do not always approve of the things that you do, I always approve of you. My son needed to hear that. I needed to tell my son that because there had been a lot of disapproval of what he'd been doing lately. And I was a little bit concerned that maybe, because this is possible, my son might fall into the rut of thinking that, that I do not approve of him. That's not it at all, though, is it? I, I love my son. I, I accept my son for who he is and who God made him. But that doesn't mean I approve of his actions. Hence, discipline. As a means by which to build the character and to bring him into line with truth. Then, at which point his actions are as approved as he is. In my eyes. And this is why my child does not actually need me to accept his actions and decisions in order to have confidence. That he will still be loved and accepted by me because the actions and decisions they make will not be accepted by me if they fall outside of truth. And it is my privilege and duty as a father then to orient my child's mind back to truth, whether he likes it or not, through discipline, through correction. But none of that will threaten any perception of my love toward him because my love has never been conditioned upon his actions or his decisions. My love has been implicit. My intentions toward him are right. And while he, his, his deceitful heart may deny that to be true, might say that that, 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 that isn't true, uh, proof bears out that it is true. If I'm being the kind of father I ought to be. My love simply must take on a different form or expression depending upon his actions and his decisions. When my child is aligned with truth, engaged in righteous actions and thinking. My love is able to be expressed in those good gifts that the father desires to give to his children. My good intentions toward my child are able to be expressed in more full ways because my child is aligned with his father and with truth. When my child is not aligned with truth, engaged in unrighteous actions, unrighteous thinking, my love must be expressed in a different way. And that way is going to be through discipline, through correction that I'm required to give to my children. And then as my children get older and they're no longer under my discipline and my correction directly, then I do not withhold my love as a means by which, but I must withhold my support if their actions are outside of truth. 
And in that day, my children will know that mom and dad do not agree with their actions or their decisions, and their decisions are theirs to make, and their actions are theirs to take. But they will not be able to doubt my love and intentions toward them if I'm as I ought to be as a father. And I cannot stress enough that this is the spirit of discipline, calling them back to truth. Discipline and correction is not a way for you to vent your anger on your child for their actions or inactions. That's called child abuse. Discipline, in fact, is not naturally connected to anger at all. You might well be angry when you discipline your child. As we'll see from God's example regularly in the Old Testament, there were plenty of times where God was angry when he disciplined Israel. But whether he was angry or not didn't, did not change the discipline. The discipline is not a product of the anger. The emotion you're feeling in the moment and the discipline are not connected to each other. Whether you're angry or not, the discipline is the same. The discipline is not a product of the anger. That's when child abuse happens. When discipline is a product of anger. When discipline is consistent on the basis of aligning with truth, regardless of my emotional state, then I'm in a place of objective and right, loving, care, and discipline. And that should be, and indeed must exist, that discipline in the same form or fashion, regardless of my emotional state. Discipline and correction do not exist to vent my anger. They do not exist to enforce conformity to my way or my thinking in my children. I'm not creating little Jamins for my own little kingdom. Discipline and correction serve to cultivate in my children truth and righteousness. And truth and righteousness are founded upon obedience and submission. So there will be an aspect of submission in my home to father, but not to wield that submission as a hammer unto conformity, but rather to teach them how to align their hearts with their authorities in the hope and prayer that if they can do that with their earthly father, then they'll be much better at doing it to their heavenly father when they read this book and realize what their heavenly father expects of them. That's the goal. What more can a father ask than that his children grow up to love the Lord and submit to his will? That's what discipline instills. And this is how our heavenly father deals with us, and so this is how we're called to deal with our children. And that's the long and the short of our contemplations about fathers today. Fathers, what does it look like to be a godly father? You and I don't have to guess. Yes, there's actually very little direct instruction on the do's and the don'ts of fatherhood in the Bible. Very little of actual do's and don'ts. Uh, basically, there's only a few direct commands in the scriptures to fathers. One, spank your children. Proverbs 13, verse 24, Proverbs 23, 13. To spare the rod is to hate your child, which, as we've said already, is not taking out your anger upon a child. When you hit a child because they've offended you or you hit a child in anger, you are abusing your child. You're not disciplining your child. Spanking, proper discipline, is a call to access the heart of your child through non-permanent, non-damaging imposition of pain upon them for the purpose of drawing their hearts in submission to truth. This is not abuse. This will never be abuse. This will never be never produce the terrible spiritual, physical, or emotional effects of abuse. That kind of discipline, true discipline, as, as realized through the rod, as realized through a spanking, non-permanent, non-damaging imposition of physical pain for the purpose of drawing their hearts into submission and truth, this will never be abuse. This will never produce the physical, spiritual, or emotional effects of abuse. If someone says, I got spanked and I, I was abused and I had all these effects from it, they were not spanked, they were abused. And there's a difference. And it's a big difference. It will only produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness in those who are exercised thereby. So we're commanded in the Bible to spank our children. That one's very clear. Second, we're commanded to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Third, we're commanded to not provoke our children to wrath lest they be discouraged, Colossians 3.21. We could debate a few other commands, but they are relatively few. Not a whole lot of verses in the Bible directly stating how it is that we father our children. And yet there is by no means a, a, a lack of instruction. And the reason is because we are children of a heavenly father. 
And every day we experience the various aspects of being a child of our Heavenly Father. We throw fits, we get into uh, uh, difficult states, we rebel, uh, we align, we ask for things, we seek out things, we seek to align with the will of our Father, we seek to understand the will of our Father. And we do all of these things and then we see how our Father disposes Himself toward us and we read about how our Father disposes Himself toward us and we can see a great deal of what it is to be a father. You have a father in heaven who is a perfect father. He perfectly administers discipline. He perfectly gives good gifts. He perfectly pursues and listens and supports. He perfectly provides. And so may we today as well, fathers, through this brief study, be encouraged in our own fatherhood to be good representatives to our children of our heavenly father, to be good fathers and through it to lead our children into the peaceable fruit of righteousness lead our children unto their good Heavenly Father. Let's close in prayer. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.